So, we are going to discuss today scanning and transmission electron microscopy. So, we are going to the next slide now. So, what electron microscopy is all about is that you are going to use electron as a probe. So, one of the interesting aspect of electron relates to the most fundamental discoveries of the last century by de Broglie and that is your wave particle duality. Until you invoke this wave particle duality, you will not be able to appreciate the advantage of using electron as probe. Recall your high school learning of de Broglie hypothesis. I do not require more than that knowledge. So, what does it say that particle nature will permit us to image the material as different length scale and those length scales are basically sub microscopic to atomic scale that is the brilliance of using electron as a probe. Wave nature of electron shall facilitate diffraction phenomena. Diffraction is supposed to be characteristic of crystalline materials prior to 1984, but after 1984 with the seminal discovery of cosi crystals, people started talking about the diffraction can also be seen from quasi crystalline materials. So, when I am talking to you today, if I have to say that how many uh, atomic order is possible then I will be saying that in materials in the solid state we will have crystalline, quasi crystalline and non crystalline state. Now, we shall be going to the next slide and this is all about that I have told you. Here is the incident beam from there is an electron source and you have accelerated that electron with high k b. By k b I mean kilo volt. So, the beam is incident upon the specimen. This is your the, the yellow color thing that you are seeing is your specimen. Now, in the scanning electron microscopy you are just above the top surface. So, you can have secondary electrons, you can have characteristic x rays, you can have the back scattered electron. We are not going to discuss today OJ electron and visible light. Whereas, in transmission mode, you will be having direct beam passing through this then there are going to be electrons that are, that are elastically scattered, there are going to be electrons that are inelastically scattered and most of the time I shall be referring to this and direct beam. In the next slide, this is the schematic of the scaling electron microscope through actual microscope also, we will be showing you in this model how the electron microscope actually scanning electron microscope looks like. So, I right on the top of it there is a electron gun, then there is a specimen the accelerated electron basically is trying to incident upon the specimen and there are some scanning coil that will permit the beam to rest around the whole of the specimen. And this specimen will have the secondary electron or the back scattered electron that is going to be detected by various detector. From the actual system, actual instrument that we have at uh, Department of Metallurgical Engineering IIT BHU, we shall be showing you the actual scanning electron microscope where varieties of such detectors are there. You, we do have edX detector, we do have secondary electron de detector, we have 
EBSD detector as well. So, on the beam, actually, you are trying to rest her in the plane of the specimen, right? In the plane of the specimen, you are trying to rest her, right? And this scanning coil will permit it to rest her around the surface of the specimen. It is simply that the size of the probe that rasters on the surface of the specimen gives you an image on a TV screen. Now, these days it is basically not the TV screen, but the computer monitor. And in that computer monitor, the size of the screen is fixed. Please note that in the whole of the lens system, they are the electromagnetic lenses and there is nothing like magnifying lenses here. So, the argument that you are going to understand here is that how do you get the magnification? You get the magnification because the size of the spot, electron spot that rasters on the surface of the specimen can be monitored, it can be changed. So, the image plane that is the image, the size of the image the remains the same, whereas the your ability to investigate finer and finer here is changing. So, you can very well understand if the area that you want to observe is smaller and smaller and the size of the image remains the same, the size of the image and the size of the object obviously gives you the magnification. This is how the magnification is attained. But I must tell you that magnification and resolution are not one and the same thing that we should be able to explain as we proceed. And that is going to be the central theme of the whole of electron microscopy or microscopy in general. Anybody who talks about microscopy, you should be able to see about the microscope, resolution as well as magnification. But the resolution is going to be the most crucial thing. In the next slide, the most important advantage of both the variants of microscope that I am going to talk to you relates to depth of field and depth of focus. Depth of focus and the depth of field are the two central concept in electron microscopy. The depth of field of a microscope is a measure of how much that the object we are looking at remains in focus at the same time. So, what does it mean? It simply tells you that this is related to object space. So, having explained depth of field, now I am going to talk to you about depth of focus. So, depth of focus refers to the distance over which the image can move relative to the object and still remain in focus. So, therefore, how are you going to understand it? Depth of field is in the object space. Depth of focus is in the image space. For example, my friends are trying to capture me with the help of a camera and that camera basically they would like that I should remain in focus along with the other object of interest together. If it is so, then that relates to depth of field. They also imply something like field of view, close up, not close up shot and everything. All these concept of everyday photography, they have to be understood by all of us who are trying to use electron microscope. So, now we are going to discuss in the next slide further that depth of focus and the field. Any modern SEM, you will be able to see a resolution, this term I am going to explain later, of the order of 1 nanometer and 10 nanometer. It is not as good as I am going to talk to you when I am going to explain transmission electron microscope that it is far more, far more competent microscope than this scanning electron microscope. But there are features of engineering importance that will permit you to infer something at this length scale itself. So, there is no fun in going for transmission electron microscope. So, my dear friend, you should be able to understand your sample and what feature you are looking for. 
transmission electron microscope, scanning electron microscope is not about taking photographs, it is about getting information out of those micrographs. That is the most important thing and you should remember forever, even for the light microscope you should be able to appreciate this particular thing. So, SEM images that is the scanning electron microscope image have got a depth of focus and as I have told you that this remains in the image space, it also has got better resolution than a light microscope, but the most important advantage is depth of field. I am going to demonstrate with the help of the scanning electron microscope micrograph that how a light microscope a light microscope and the scanning electron microscope is going to be different by looking at the features at different depth, it is the depth. It, you can understand it for example, if you are able to have the high fidelity stereophonic sound, what do you do? If, if the suppose that there is a concert going on, then in case you want to listen only to the to the to the person who is a vocalist and try to tone down the accompanist, you will be able to do that. So, that exactly is the thing that I can I can have the depth depending on my ability to resolve in scanning electron microscope unlike that of the light microscope. So, in the next slide this concept of depth of focus and the field is illustrated. The most important thing is that there is a something like working distance that I have shown you that a specimen stage and the microscope lens objective lens there seems to be a distance right. I have shown you in the scanning electron microscope this is specimen stage. So, the, there is a distance known as the working distance and it is this working distance that we vary for getting better depth of focus. In the next slide, we demonstrate the depth of field now. As I have told you, now the left hand side that is this guy is from a scanning electron microscope, whereas from right hand side the same object it is from the light microscope. You are able to see that there is a depth which is totally seen that this is something in the interior of it, this is the top surface, it is this depth of depth of field which is of prime importance in the characterization of materials particularly fracture. So, whenever there is a fracture piece that means, if either the specimen has a failed in tension or in compression or any other method of the stress condition, if you if you look at the fracture surface what you find is that this depth of field gives lot of advantage of interpretation of the result and you are able to predict that what kind of fracture it has. So, one of the most important advantage of scanning electron microscope is related to analyzing fractograph. So, there is a science of fractography. Is it only true for the brittle material? Is it only true for the ductile material or are you going to get it even for polymer, we shall be taking example from each of them and shall explain you the subtle feature that they possess. Now, we shall be going to the next slide, this is how any ductile material will have all metals are ductile materials, all metals are ductile material meaning thereby they, they are they are having the ability to deform permanently. So, once you try to deform it and finally, fracture the surface, then they are going to fail or fracture under ductile manner. Then this kind of dimples you will be able to see known as the dimples, see the, there are smaller dimples like this, you are able to see it. Dimples of varying shape and size you will be able to see, this is the characteristic of any any metallic materials, perhaps this is going to be from aluminum alloys. Next slide, this is from a 
polymeric bottle, you are able to see that it is definitely different from what I have shown you in the earlier one. These polymeric materials are not like the metallic materials, the crystallinity is different. So, the mode of deformation is different. So, that is why you are able to see the fracture surface with no dimple and there are some kind of hysterations that is undergoing. In the next slide, this is the material that has failed under stress in a manner that is lot of intergranular fracture is there. See, I have told you that in whenever you see scanning electron microscope, the microstructure is going to show you shape, size and distribution of various phases. It has grains, it has grain boundary. So, it is trying to fail across the grain that you are able to see it. In the next slide now, another advantage of scanning electron microscope relates to EDS. We will be showing you the DEX detector when our actual scanning electron microscope I am going to show. So, this is how the microstructure is going to look like. This is from a oxide system. Uh, in our machine, you can nicely do it oxide and the metallic without any difficulty because it has got a fake tip. This is the microstructure. You can understand the feature that it is being at 5000 angstrom or 500 nanometer. So, all these particles are you are able to see that it is going to be around 50 or 100 nanometer. So, with the help of the EDEX mapping, you will be able to know whether it has got zinc, copper or oxygen or not. So, you will be able to have the oxygen signal, zinc signal and copper signal. You will be able to actually quantify it also. These are showing the elemental map of oxygen, zinc and copper. Now, another that is going to be shown in the next slide. This is the most latest contribution of the study of the microstructure. Our quanta 200F, this is from one of our student and my colleague, where the back scattered diffraction imaging we have done and finally, we are trying to see the misorientations of the various grain. And this, this is the image in the black and white, whereas this is going to be the different orientation. So, you can have the different orientation with the help of the inverse pole figure, they are going to be of enormous importance whenever you want to understand the texture. Texture could be solidification texture, texture could be deformation texture. In this slide, the deformation texture is being shown. RD means rolling direction, normal direction and the transverse direction. Even in earth sciences, you are going to have enormous application of this kind of detector. So, you must uh, demand that you must have the quanta, uh, fake, fake source and finally, a good machine so that you are able to get this EBSD studies done on your specimen. Now, the next one is the most important. Now, this we shall be coming again and again. So, this is how the specimen stage looks like. This is known as the stub. You have over a carbon tape, you will be able to place your specimen. This we will be showing it as the configuration of our sample holder and the specimen stage we have in our quanta, SEM quanta. And uh, they, over this a polished specimen is placed and you are able to see it. This is the specimen stage for placing sample for EBSD. That means, in case you want to understand the micro texture, you, you are supposed to be fixing your sample in between this, a well polished. Remember that the 
polishing of this sample for EBS detection studies is very, very crucial and we cannot afford to compromise. Otherwise, your whole effort of using such a wonderful equipment will go in vain. So, we need to be careful. So, slot you are able to see it. So, what you do is that this has to be taken out and it has to be placed inside. Transmission electron microscope will require a very, very small diameter. See, see, are you able to see? A small diameter, 3 millimeter disc. Similarly, you can have the carbon coated grid. I must tell all of you that this carbon coated grid, you can put place this specimen here and you can put it here also. And the same thing can be placed here in the specimen holder of transmission electron microscope that I am going to discuss in the second part of this model on electron microscopy. So, please note that this is how the holder looks like for transmission electron microscope. This is how the specimen stage looks like. It has got its stuff. These are mostly of the conducting material. We normally try to insist that you make it out of aluminum normally. And this carbon coated grid, you will be able to get, get it through the market. These holders are very, very important part of, of transmission electron microscope and we should be handling it as carefully as possible. In the next slide, we are showing you now, how do you prepare transmission electron microscopic specimen? Why did I not discuss it for SEM? We did not discuss it for SEM because it is easy to make. As you prepare a specimen for light microscope in the same manner, you will be able to do this. Only for EBSD, you have to be little bit careful. Otherwise, you can have the polished surface, nicely polished surface. For metals, absolutely there is no problem. For ceramic, you have the difficulty and polymer, polymer also you will be having some difficulty. But by varying the accelerating voltage, you will be able to image it. Normally, in a scanning electron microscope, the operating voltage is restricted at 30 kV, whereas in transmission electron microscope for metals and ceramic material, we operate at around 200 kilo volts. So, the order of magnitude simply tells you that the things are going to be distinct and different whenever we are talking about transmission electron microscope and e scanning electron microscope. That is why in specimen preparation in transmission electron microscope, we devote lot of time. Only the elementary exposure I am going to give you in this series. So, now I am going to discuss something about TM sample preparation. As I have told you in the scanning electron microscope, we do not require so much of extra precaution, but here you need to because I have told you that in the scanning electron microscope, you just observe the surface, but in transmission electron microscope, electron beam should be able to go through and through. That means, you are working in a transmission mode. So, the thickness of the specimen is going to be 500 angstrom. So, now the challenge is how are you going to do that? So, two types of sample I am going to demonstrate it to you to make it. For example, powder sample, you can disperse it in a suitable solvent, ultrasonicate it, put it on the carbon coated grid and just a drop, a drop on the, on the grid is more than sufficient and the drop has to be very, very small. So, you use some kind of pipette and try to dry it, then put that grid in the specimen holder as I have shown you in the previous slide. Suppose that somebody says, no, I have the bulk sample. Yes, you can do it, bulk sample as well. The first step is that you should be able to have a 3 millimeter disc and normally the thickness that you can cut with any kind of cutter, it can go up to 300 micrometer. Remember, you have to after grind, you have to go down to 60 micrometer and then from the many of the variants of the technique, you can go to 
100 nanometer or so remember 50 nanometer is desirable. So, electrochemical polishing is one of the methods you do have the iron mill thinning and many variants of making a specimen is going to be there. So, you can adopt any one of them depending on the kind of facility that you have. Now, in the next slide we shall deliberate on resolution as I have told you magnification is not resolution. By resolution we mean our ability to resolve the two points that are separated by a minimum distance what is the capability. For example, I can only resolve 1 by tenth of a millimeter when the object is located in front of you at 25 centimeter any healthy eye is expected to be that not uh, the kind of eye that I have because I, I wear a glass. So, if suppose that if you are having a optical microscope with the average wavelength of 550 nanometer based on your high school learning you, you are able to recollect that this is the average right in the ultraviolet uh, in the violet side it is around 380 nanometer or so. In the right hand side that is the red side it is around going to be 700 nanometer or so. So, if you look at the average of it, it is going to be around 500 nanometer. So, at this 500 nanometer the, the, the resolution is around 300 nanometer. So, if in case you try to convert in, into micron it is going to be 0 0.3 micrometer. So, any feature less than 0 0.3 micrometer you will not be able to see with the help of visible light microscope. So, what is the alternative? The alternative is that try to use transmission electron microscope or a scanning electron microscope. A scanning electron microscope feature is 1 nanometer or so. Remember recall I have already told you about the scanning electron microscope it is of the order of 1 nanometer. Now, you come to the transmission electron microscope the resolution is going to be of the order of 1.4 angstrom or 0 0.14 nanometer is this the limit no it is not the limit the best machine can really have of the order of 0 0.05 nanometer meaning thereby around 500 around 0.5 angstrom that's the that's the classical um, achievement of the last century last couple of uh, decades only. We do have in the country some of the machines of transmission electron microscope that can really resolve, but particularly for the oxide system. In the next slide this is how the whenever the accelerating voltage is increasing the wavelength is going to be asking you that you must have the relativistic correction. Those of us who are exposed to little bit of physics will remember that any electron that is accelerated beyond a particular limit the velocity is going to be very large then we must have the relativistic correction thanks to great man like Einstein which permits us to infer lambda in terms of the Planck's constant and the other variable that are well known. This table gives you or any book is going to give you all the necessary necessary constant. This is what the wave particle duality is all about. So, this lambda is trying to be related to the Planck constant and this is just like your some kind of momentum this is the relativistic momentum. So, from the relativistic momentum you will be able to know what is the lambda. In the next slide we give you the table of the relativistic wavelength along with the non relativistic wavelength that you can have depending on the accelerating voltage. So, 100 for example, our machine is 200. So, you are able to see it that the, the wavelength is going to be 0 0.0025 nanometer. You can ask a question why did we not raise this with respect to visible light? because visible light has got already a fixed wavelength whereas, electron is not a wave thanks to wave particle duality that electron behaves like a wave of 
different wavelength and these different wavelengths are going to be dependent on the accelerating voltage right the other parameters you can just apply the expression that I have shown you and you can get it without any difficulty. In the next slide, we are repeating that what are the things you can get it that there is a electron beam and there is a specimen. The upper one is only for a scanning electron microscope, right? All these features that, that you are able to see it, they are for the scanning electron microscope. Whereas, once the beam is passing, then this part belongs to your transmitted electron microscope. You can have the internal structure, you can have the orientation and identification of crystal, you can have the elemental analysis, you can also have elemental analysis in scanning electron microscope as I have told you. For example, the characteristic X-ray radiation will permit you for the micro analysis. But here, the feature at different length scale you will be able to see it and those length scale are well below nanometer, 1 nanometer, 2 nanometer, 3 nanometer and so on and so forth. In the next slide, we are giving you just to give you an idea the difference between the uh, light microscope and the equivalent to stage electron microscope. Here, this is the light microscope. All these are basically the lenses made up of ceramic glasses, whereas all these lenses are from made up of electromagnetic lenses. So, you can, you can have a similar correlation and line diagram of the same kind, but remembering that in electron microscope you are dealing electron, they are subject to lot of other complications. In the next slide, this is the classical view of the electron microscope, transmission electron microscope. We will be showing you our transmission electron microscope actual equipment which is operating at 200 kV. This was the classical version of the microscope, the first generation microscope. Now, this is too old, it has got lot of different modification. However, if you look at the essential feature, then it has got a electron gun, it has got condenser lenses, there is a stage where the specimen is put, there are objective lenses, intermediate lenses and then there are projector lenses known as the first projector or the projector lens system that you must have. And finally, you can either see it on a fluorescent screen or you can also record it with the help of a camera and finally, connect it to the new generation of of computer system. The new machine that we have has got the some of the modern features that we have at the moment. In the next slide, we want to show you that concurrently you can have image as well as the diffraction pattern unlike a scanning electron microscope. So, it is the same lens system, the only thing is that you, you try to control the lens current of the various lens system that you have, you will be able to see it the image or the diffraction pattern. So, the beautiful part is that along with the image, you will be able to see the diffraction pattern. So, you see the image and finally, tell that this is the kind of crystal structure that, that it has. So, look at the configuration that once you are having the uh, condenser lens is there and the collimated beam is trying to come. This is the specimen at both places shown in this color. Then there are objective lenses, then you have objective aperture. If you insert the objective aperture, then the you are going in the image mode. In case you are removing the objective aperture, then the first diffraction pattern is formed on the back focal plane of it. And finally, you can enlarge it and on the fluorescent screen you will be able to see the final diffraction pattern. I will be showing you how a diffraction pattern will be looking like and how an image is going to look like in the electron microscope. In the next slide, 
these are the two important imaging technique. So, remember that until you have a diffraction pattern, you will not be able to appreciate what is going on in transmission electron microscope. So, there are some direct beam, there are some diffracted beam. If I stop it with the help of the objective aperture and permit it to fall like this, then what we get is known as the bright field image. So, in the bright field image, you try to construct image with the help of direct beam, right. So, the, you are going to form an image, how the image is going to look like, I am going to demonstrate. And in case you remove the objective aperture and stop the dar, diffracted uh, direct beam and let any one of the diffracted beam you try to take it and construct an image, then this is how the dark field images are formed. So, this is the central configuration of the central dark field, this is the shifted dark field. So, there are two variants of the dark field imaging techniques that are existing in the in the modern system and the people normally adopt the central dark field. So, in the next slide, we are trying to show you how the diffraction pattern is going to look like this is known as the single crystal diffraction pattern. Remember your bulk specimen is polycrystalline, but you are able to see a single crystal diffraction pattern. Unlike x-ray diffraction technique, powder diffraction technique from the bulk specimen is going to give you a feature that is contributing from all the variants of the grain. Remember in transmission electron microscope, even if the material is polycrystalline, you will, you will be able to collect diffraction information from each of the single grain that behaves like a single crystal. So, this is how the, as you know that uh, there are uh, 7 crystal system and 14 Bravais lattices in 3 dimensional crystallography. This is the typical face centered cubic single crystal diffraction pattern all these are diffracted spot, diffracted spot right. And this is how the indexing is done, but this is not the part of the model that is going to discuss it, because that becomes a lecture in itself. And as and when the opportunity arise, I will also explain it to you, how these indexing are done. In the in this bracket, this is known as the zone axis, by zone axis we mean the, the beam direction eventually, but it has to be explained little bit, which is not part of this model. In the next slide, this is work from one of our doctoral student, what is, he is trying to say, convince you is that this is how the powder diffraction will be looking like, right. Remember in the previous slide, you had a spotty ring, whereas this is known as the ring pattern. So, this is a this is this ring pattern is from a polycrystalline material. Normally, the the aperture, the diffraction aperture that you have is of couple of microns, and therefore, as you are able to see that this microstructure is at a length scale of 200 nanometer. So, if you, you if you think of, then they are hardly of 10 to 20 nanometer or so. And this fragile, these length scales are further less than around 2 to 3 nanometer. So, you can put the diffraction aperture as a whole and in case you record the diffraction pattern, then this is how it is going to look like. How do you recognize that this is an image and this is a diffraction pattern? By looking at the micron marker itself. Remember, it is nanometer inverse and this is actually as nanometer. So, in the next slide, we are trying to show one of a very lucid work of one of our doctoral students, where this is a gold nanoparticle. So, you are able to see that this is around 100 nanometer or so. So, from the 100 nanometer particle, you are able to see the diffraction pattern. 
this is the dark field as I have told you, you can have the bright field image and the dark field image. So, some of the from any one of the spot you can construct the dark, dark field image and finally, in the dark field as you are able to see that the diffraction spot intensity of the diffracted spot from where it is trying to come from this particle it is going to show as white and the other region is going to be dark. And remember that the it is the same triangular particle that you are able to see it here. In the next slide we are going to the scanning transmission electron microscope mode. As I have told you that even in transmission electron microscope you, if you have the stem detector then you will be able to see the image from the surface. The only beautiful part is going to be that these, these image are going to be at very very final length scale. So, for example, in the gold copper nano structures you are able to see the microstructure and each of the particle you can really see it with the help of the head up detector. And you can again see the map because we, if the candidate is trying to or the researcher is trying to claim that it is the gold and copper then they will ask that you show me that you have the gold and copper particle here Go, uh, gold and copper atom both present. So, this is the particle one of them it is here and then this is the mapping corresponding to the gold this is the mapping corresponding to copper in the same particle meaning thereby that the gold and the copper both are present in this therefore, the author perhaps is correct in asserting that they are dealing with gold copper nano structures. In the next slide I am going to demonstrate or assert the kind of importance that electron microscopy of both the variant that is the scanning electron microscope and the transmission electron microscope hold promise for varieties of studies. Some of them are listed here imaging at microscopic and sub microscopic scale. Example of this I have already given you through my lecture. One example of texture I have given you because there was a deformation texture in the scanning electron microscope. You can have phase transformation studies, you can have chemical analysis at microscopic length scale. This demonstration I have given you for scanning electron microscope by the edX signal and transmission electron microscope in the STM mode. You can investigate phenomena at atomic scale all these are important for the studies of materials as well as the pattern. This pattern is very very important for our sciences even the phases that are present in nature known as the branch of mineralogy that the geologists and geosciences are interested in they will be able to do it. One of the bread and butter of the geologists they are the phase form of the rocks various kinds of transformation that takes place. So, phase form along with the phase transformation at different length scale can be studied the only thing is that you must try to prepare a specimen of the kind that I have told you for a scanning electron microscope and transmission electron microscope respectively. I can assure you these two variants of electron microscope is very very important for studies of phase transformation microstructural evolution and many other variants. The last slide will be giving you my biographic sketch. So, with that I thank you very much for being with us, thank you very much.